All right, I think we're ready to go. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. My name is Andrea and I uh, run customer experience here at ProudPad. And with me today is the wonderful Keji who will be talking about continuous discovery and the importance of customer feedback. Uh, before we get uh, started and I hand things over to Keji, please know that we will be answering questions at the end. Uh, so if you wanna drop questions on the Q&A tab or the chat tab, I'll be filling those uh, towards the end uh, of the talk. Uh, so stick around, we will have a little discussion and we are going to answer your questions. Uh, with that said, Keji, go ahead. Thanks, Thank you very much, Andrea. And uh, thanks everyone for joining today. And thanks to Andrea and ProPad for inviting me to, to speak. Um, I'll just start with a, a brief introduction about myself and, and my background. So at the moment, I'm a product manager at a company called Voxpot Me. And we're a video insights platform that helps big brands um, do market research and collect feedback from their customers um, using uh, the power of video. So um, actually discovery is like a big part of the product that I'm involved in at the moment. Um, I'm also uh, the Product Tank Regional Coordinator for EMEA region. I actually run Product Tank in Birmingham. So if anyone's ever in the Birmingham region, um, please feel free to drop by to our Product Tank and say hello. And uh, I've just put there that I'm a purveyor of ever-changing hairstyles because the hairstyle I've got right now is very different to the one that Andrea put in the, uh, in the um, invitation. So, And I can confirm, I can <laughs> confirm she has the best hairstyles for anyone that's interested. Thank you very much. So yeah, um, if we ever meet, um, I'll probably look very different because of my hair. Um, so let's, uh, let's move on. I've got a couple of caveats um, before I get started. Um, so this is the first time that I've kind of spoken publicly um, on a topic. So um, I'd appreciate the feedback from people at the end. Um, but I just wanted to say that I'm not an expert. Um, I'm really just here to share what I've pretty much mostly learned from others and some of my own experiences. Um, there will be gifts for which I have no apologies, and there might be some Star Trek related gifts and references. Kind of sorry, but not very sorry about that. So just warning you all in advance, um, you know, just be prepared. So today I'm coming to talk to you about um, how to maximize customer feedback for success as part, product success as part of the discovery process. So, um, as, as product managers and, and you know, the breadth of things that we do in product management, I think that the discovery process is one of the favorite aspects of mine in product management. I particularly love the aspects of discovery that involve talking with customers and getting feedback. Well, that's essentially one of the most favorite things of mine to do. Um, so before we get started, let's kind of do a, a bit of a what, you know, uh, set the scene for what is this discovery business all about then. Um, so I think that Product teams are often stepping into the realm of the unknown. So it's uh, to boldly go where no one has gone before. I'll just get that first Star Trek reference in there and then we can proceed. Um, but actually, is it really to go where no one has gone before? I think that product teams, we're often stepping into the realm of the unknown for our team, but actually we're stepping into the world of people who know a lot, um, so the customers. Um, so what we're really doing is we're exploring the world that the customers know inside out and we're trying to get that knowledge from them. So I'd like to explore some of my favorite definitions from um, you know, people who, have, who are actual experts and who have thought much more deeply than me on this, um, kind of some major discovery juggernauts that I hope that you've all heard of. So the first one is Teresa Torres. I don't think anyone ever has a, a chat about discovery and her name doesn't come up. Um, so if you're not aware of who she is, then please go and check her out. Um, but she tells us that basically um, discovery is, is um, the thing we do to help us decide what to build. So rather than going into things with the idea up front and, and just being sure only to learn that we've, um, we've, we've not chosen the right thing, she sees the discovery process as the process that actually helps us to figure out what those things that we should be going on to build is, as opposed to delivery, which is how we build it. Um, that's all meant that with Marty Kagan. So he says, he says the same thing pretty much, but he elaborates that with the discovery. Essentially, we're trying to address these kind of four areas of, of product risk. So we're trying to eliminate these four types of product risks. So the value aspect, which is, you know, is the customer going to buy this? Will they choose to use it? Is it a problem that's worth solving? Feasibility, which is, can we actually build it? Um, do we have the capability? Do we have the knowledge? Do we have the tools? Um, usability risk, which is, you know, once we've decided what to do, can the uh, user actually figure out how to use it? And then there's the business viability risk. So does this solution work for our business? 
if we come up with a good problem, we've come up with some solutions, but actually legally we just can't do that, for example, that would be a, a huge business risk. So those are, are some of the dimensions for thinking about how we do discovery. And then uh, Tim Herbig, uh, he says that it's a flexible period during which you and your team focus on building the right thing, as opposed to building the thing right, which would be the product delivery phase, not dissimilar to what Teresa Torres says. And what I am, um, what I particularly like about this, um, this definition is that where he uses that word flexible period and i think what what he's saying here if you go and kind of uh, look up tim herbig and he's got a really fantastic resource on product discovery um so i highly recommend that you check that out and what he's trying to say there is that you know discovery isn't linear so i think often people think that it's this thing that you do at a specific point and only that point and then you move on to the next thing and you never look back it's actually it's, it's iterative and it's flexible and you might cycle back round on discovery at various stages of the product process. So I really like that because it, it kind of puts that, that idea into, into the definition. In my mind, I try to frame it as exploring and figuring out what to solve in two spaces. So what are we gonna solve in the problem space? Figuring that out. And then once we figured out what we're gonna solve in the problem space, figuring out what we're going to solve in the solution space. So essentially validating or invalidating our ideas about how to solve a problem in the solution space, whereas the problem space is actually there's a bunch of problems, which is the right one for us to go and uh, spend time solving. Um, but the, ultimately, the important thing is that the customer should be involved and consulted in both those spaces. And also the whole team should be involved in both those spaces of the discovery um, process. So it shouldn't be that, you know, you go off and um, we go off and we do discovery in the problem space and, and not really include anyone in the team. And only at the point where we're sure about the problem or we've got some ideas for solutions is where we start to engage the wider team. I think you, we need to involve the wider team much, much earlier in the process. Okay, so um, I'd like to talk about why you should always be listening to customers. Um, so this talk is, is about discovery, but it's very much focused on um, the customer side, the customer feedback and how, how we talk to customers. Um, so get out of the office and listen to customers. I think the word listening is important. It, the sentence was originally going to be, you know, get out of the office and talk to customers. But actually, it's not about what we've got to say. It's about hearing what the customers have got to say and what they tell us constantly in many different ways. And uh, getting out of the office is in quotation marks because it doesn't mean literally getting out of the office, although I would highly recommend doing that too. But these days, there are so many ways to get out of the office in, you know, in quotation marks and connect with our customers without, without actually leaving. But um, I think there are different contexts in which we, we are listening to customers. So there are times when we're listening to customers in, a, in what is kind of a generative way. So it's not that we've gone to listen to a customer to speak about a specific thing. We're just listening to customers because, because we want to learn more about the users. We want to learn more about the context. We want to understand the levers that drive their behaviors and what's important to them. And this helps us to identify those opportunities and, and generate those ideas. And the reason we do that is because we want this really, really deep understanding of the customer, um, discovering things that we just, we just can't know. Even if we're domain ex experts, we have a lot of knowledge about our customers. We have a lot of knowledge about the domain. There are just things that we cannot possibly begin to understand or imagine about you know, their day to day, what they're doing, the things that drive and motivate them, what pressures they're facing from you know, up and down the chain that influence the behaviors that they have. And that kind of discovery is really about understanding that. And I think there's another type of uh, discovery where we're listening to customers in a more um, evaluative way. So we're listening to customers about a specific problem that we're, we're trying to solve or an opportunity or an idea that we've previously discovered from, talk, from listening to customers or a solution that we're designing. So in that context, we're, about, we're trying to validate a, a specific thing. And it's, it's not about a more general, what can we discover? Uh, this is more about, we've discovered something and now we want to validate something else. So this, this kind of discovery is definitely being driven and it should be being driven and tied to the outcome that we're trying to achieve. So here's an outcome we're trying to achieve and we're going to then go and do some discovery and um, validate or invalidate the ideas that we have around um, how we might deliver that outcome. I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, some of my favorite um, discovery toolkit items. And you know, the, there are many tools and techniques and artifacts that come out of discovery. Um, there's many tools and techniques that help you plan and do discovery. Um, because today we're talking mainly about customer feedback in particular, 
these are just a few of the techniques from my toolkit that I, I particularly enjoy using when gathering customer feedback. So my favorite by hands down has got to be customer interviews. I just really like having those conversations with customers and listening to them tell you about their processes, their workflows, you know, showing you what they're doing. Um, so observations are really good one, actually. Um, just watching people do things um, and user testing where you, you get them to execute tasks, for example. So this is more when you're validating, say, some solutions. You're getting people to do their, their usual tasks or, or try out something new and you'll listen to them tell you, you know, what, what that's making them feel, how that's going to uh, impact their processes. But ultimately, customer interviews are my favorite because they're the ones where, you know, you don't have to be talking about a specific thing. It could just be, tell me about how you um, go about doing this thing. Tell me why you're trying to do this thing. Um, what do you do? You know, what are the trigger points for you getting to, um, to this point and what, what drives that? I think I've found that for me, those are some of the most illuminative conversations when it comes to uh, customer um, discovery and customer feedback. Um, one of the other ones that I quite like is silent participation. So, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, bumming along on a trip with a salesperson or your customer success team and you know you're not there you're not there to do anything as a product person you're just there to listen and um i think sometimes that can um that can uh throw people they're like why is this random person in the room not really contributing but once you you kind of explain why you're there and and everyone feels comfortable you just get so much out of that and uh, i really enjoy that as well and i think story mapping exercises or journey mapping exercises are really good um, and it's really good when you involve the customers in that as well. So getting them to walk you through a process, identify all the tasks. And it, those are really interesting conversations because people do things and not really think about, you know, how they do it, all of the steps. When you start to have that conversation with people and they start to realize just all the things they do. And well, actually, the reason that I do this is because of this other thing. And then suddenly a bunch of other steps appear. Those are really interesting conversations because people uh, start to examine the reasons why they do things and what triggers the things they do. And that starts to reveal kind of opportunities in other places as well. So those are just some of my favorites. I know there's quite a lot, um, but just thought I'd, I'd, I'd run through a few of the ones that I, I particularly like using when it comes to getting customer feedback. And I'd like to talk about things about listening to customers, um, whether it's in a customer interview, a discovery workshop, you know, whatever discovery technique that you're, you're utilizing at that point. In order to listen well, I think we have to be willing to do a few things. And, and these are just um, a few of the things that I think you have to be able to do to listen well. It, it's not an exhaustive list, but some of the top ones for me. So the first is um, you have to have an exploration mind mindset. You have to behave like an anthropologist. You know, if, if you're a Game of Thrones fan, you have to be like Jon Snow, but you know, you know nothing. So start, start that as your, um, let that be your starting point. You are Jon Snow and you know nothing, right? So come at things with an exploration mind mindset and it from the perspective that you'll find what you'll find, you'll discover what you'll discover. You have to be really curious and not take everything at face value. You have to really delve deep and actually challenge the customers that you're talking to, challenge them to delve deeper to. Um, you have to kind of look ahead and behind what it is they're telling you and, and really think about where they're coming from and actually where they're gonna go with what they're doing. Um, so you kind of just be really, really curious and, and, and approach things in that way. The second one is you have to be willing to blow up your assumptions. Like don't go in trying to validate things um, in fact, go in trying to invalidate things. I think it's often uh, a flaw for everyone, myself included, that we, we will have some hypotheses, we'll have some assumptions, and we go in with the mindset of trying to validate them. I think it's, it's a habit that you have to build. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm very guilty of it too. It's a habit we all have to build, which is actually go into it really open-minded or go into it actually trying to invalidate those, those assumptions and hypotheses rather than going in um, trying to validate them and be willing, be willing and actually find it to be a success when you invalidate and you blow up those assumptions. So that's uh, number two for me. And then the third one that I want to talk about is, is shedding your ego. You know, don't take things so personally. Um, I think as product people, we, we have to have thick skins. Um, but at the same time, you know, our products are, our, you know, they're our product babies. So we've got this tendency to be really protective of our product babies. It's like your first child. You know, if, if a product was a second child, it probably would, would not be so protective. But we get defensive about it and that means that we will try to steer the conversation we'll try to convince the customer we'll try to defend our decisions you know just stop just stop doing any of that 
we've got to shed all of that if we're really really listening to customers we have to learn to just be humble shed the ego and just really listen to what they're telling us and try to empathize with where it's coming from because the customers aren't there you know trying to you know dismiss our work or or tell us how rubbish everything is they're genuinely trying to solve problems in their day-to-day -day life so the frustrations that come from that can sometimes be hard to bear um, but if you come at it from a assume good intent in everything then actually um, those you will navigate those conversations better and you'll, you'll be a better listener when you're when you're talking to customers okay so what i'd like to talk about now is um, a few of what i call the magic moments of discovery so um, i hope everyone on the uh, on the webinar is appreciating this particular slide uh, the magic moment of discovery and i've got the uh, the, the starship from star trek that i just want to say I do. <laughs> I'm hoping I'm getting some appreciation for this. You absolutely are from me. Please know that. <laughs> okay. Anyway, let me talk about the magic moments of discovery. So what I mean by this is that if, if some of these things happen, then they're signs that you're doing it right. And again, this is not an exhaustive list, but some of my favorite moments that are actually tied to um, experiences that I've had. Um, and some of the things I'm going to talk about naturally may not feel like things that are magic moments or positive but actually i think they are so the first one magic moment one is when you go into a situation with a customer um a feedback situation a conversation you think you understood the problem only to find out you really didn't understand the problem right so what happens there is the the idea you went in with is completely debunked or it's completely reframed in a in a different way um, so the example that I always use for this is um, back when I was working in ed tech um, and I was working with um, higher education and uh, librarians and academics, they had this review. There was this, this part of our product where, you know, every year before the term started, the review process about the, the courses and the, the resources that people were using. And we knew there were problems with the, the review process. And we, we'd had lots of feedback and lots of conversations with customers about the existing review process. And there were lots of ideas about how we could improve that. But once we actually started delving really deeply into the process, both before they got to the review and on the other side of the review, um, all of the ideas that we had to improve it were just completely thrown out the door. What we realized was that people didn't want to review everything. They just wanted a, a difference report. So we actually created a whole new area of the system um, and really dramatically reduced the time that people were spending doing this, this task. And that was just from really understanding what, what went into that process and what came out of that process and, and less about the process itself. People didn't want to actually do the process. They just wanted to get from one side to the other side faster. So this was a really, really good example of, you know, that light bulb moment where we're in these conversations and you just suddenly realize that no one cares about this thing we're trying to fix. They just want us to, they just want to have a difference report. They don't want to even have to look at this thing. They only want to focus on the things that have changed and, and deal with those. So that was a really, um, really good moment for me in terms of understanding that you can go in with an idea and completely just, that you can throw it out the window. You shouldn't be af afraid to do that either. So that's a magic moment one, when you realize that you can completely reframe something um, from what you learn from customers. Um, the second one is um, that moment when you really understand something about the customer that illuminates their behavior. So, you know, it's, it's like, a, it's another light bulb moment. So a recent example is um, it, at Vox Pop Me at the moment, we've been trying to understand the different modes people could be in when they use the product. So there are different areas of the product that you can use in different ways, depending on what mode you're in. We've been really struggling to define what those modes were and who, who those customers were, what personas um, did which at what time. And in a customer see, we were, we were speaking with a, a customer and she, um, you know, we were asking her to just tell us about how she used the product, why she used it this way, what were the trigger points. And she described to us how she used it. And then she actually then went, well, actually my colleague uses it a completely different way. And she went through that as well. And she actually um, then came up with terms that we now use internally in terms of how we think about people who are um, using the products. So she described herself as, um, 
uh, I think she described herself as, as a Star Trek, so as an explorer. So she said, you know, I'm just going in there, I'm exploring, I don't have a specific thing I'm looking for, I'm just trying to see what there is that's useful, that could be interesting, versus my colleague who, she's got a very specific goal, she's on a journey, so she's like Lord of the Rings, and she's like on that journey, leaving the Shire, she knows exactly where she's got to, got to get to, and um, you know, it was fantastic. And that's terminology that we now use internally to, to describe those modes and those types of personas. And that was something that we'd just not been able to put our finger on. We knew people were doing things differently, but didn't really understand why and the things that drove it. So that moment for me is like a really, really magic moment where something just clicks about why people do something or behave a certain way or the type of user that they are. And then the third one that I want to talk about is, um, yeah, this is, I think this is probably the one that can initially not really feel like a magic moment, but actually it is. So being uncomfortable, if you're not cringing at some point, you're probably not doing right. So you have to, you have to lean into the discomfort that our customers feel. Um, so if you ever watched a customer show you or tell you how they do something, describe a particular workflow or watch them use your product and you've just been cringing all the way through. I think that if you've not had that, then amazing you've obviously got a super amazing product that no one ever has trouble with but for me that's a truly magic moment it's it's the moment where you're really feeling their pain you're properly building empathy at that point um you know without wanting to to plug fox pop me here but we see this essentially illustrated time and time again with when our customers and our users bring their users into the boardroom so what you've got here are a big brands who are doing uh, you know, they do market research they're doing quant uh, research and you know they go into boardrooms and they try to bring the consumer into the boardroom with them and they do that with numbers and charts and that just doesn't work whereas with vox pop me um they can augment that information that data which is solid data but they can augment that with you know a video a show reel of actual consumers speaking in their own words telling them what they think telling them about their pain and we've seen time and time again how that really helps to build empathy so um i think this is probably my favorite magic moment in terms of it's an uncomfortable one, but actually I think it's the one that creates the most empathy for customers, um, both for, for, for myself and also for the wider team and the wider organization as well. So um, I'd say if you're not cringing um, at some point, then you've got some work to do. Okay, and then the, I think the treasure that you get at the end of a discovery process falls into kind of three things. I've touched on one of those already, which is that empathy side of things. It's about us really, really deeply understanding the customer and then building empathy around the problems that they face and not just for the product team but for the wider team and the wider organization as well and it's also then it means that we're finding the right problems to solve and we're building the right thing so actually when we go ahead and build things where we have far more certainty that they're the right things to be building and that's um, i think the the real treasure of going through a discovery process so just want to move on now to talking about kind of how we can harness all the sources of, of customer feedback. So I think discovery is, is a team sport. Um, while I really enjoy speaking with customers and getting feedback directly, um, one of the best things that I think we can do as product managers is accept that we are not and cannot be the only ones who are listening to customers. We're just not. Customer feedback comes from many, many sources in our organizations and it comes directly from customers in an unprompted way as well as a prompted way from our organization. Um, and people who are talking to and hearing from customers all of the time are so valuable to us as product people. So think about your sales team, think about your customer success team, think about your support teams. These are people who are customer facing. They hold an absolute wealth of customer knowledge and, and they're the source of income and feedback. Um, but it's not you know, the feedback that you should be getting from them. It's actually getting the knowledge. So they're, they're typically pretty much people who have real domain knowledge, real product knowledge and expertise. And they're really close to our customers. So they understand where our customers are. Um, they have knowledge that's unique to those teams. So we have to build relationships with them. Um, you know, join them in their, their engagements with customers. I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier. It's, it's an opportunity to listen and learn. So go, go on a sales visit, sit in with customer success check and spend a little time with support um, when needed. Um, and in addition to the feedback you capture, um, and what you'll learn, they can actually be really critical in helping us build that discovery pipeline. So, you know, because they're talking to customers all the time, they're going to know actually who's really interested in this problem, who's really interested in that problem. They have a deep understanding of where the customer is in their journey with the organization. 
they'll know which individuals to reach out to at what level for you know x y or z and so they'll be able to help us to make those connections and help us to build our, our discovery pipeline so that's why it's really important to harness all of the feedback sources within the organization um, and again discover, because discovery is a team sport we need to bring engineers into the discovery process and and just different perspectives you know team members who typically would not get in front of a customer i think it's one of the best things we can do as product managers is accept that we are not going to be the ones to come up with all the solutions it's it's important to include those members because uh they're going to be able to generate ideas identify opportunity and solutions that we just might not think of they're just going to hear the problems with a different you know with a different lens that's a bit of a weird way to describe hearing and lens and vision <laughs> um, and we need to bring kind of those different perspectives in um, some of the best discovery sessions i've had uh, with customers have included other members of the team particularly engineers um, and it's not only because of some of the questions that come up in the sessions which i just perhaps would not have thought to ask um, but because of what happens after so you know it's great because they're you know they're building that empathy for the customer as well they're really connecting why we're doing something um, to the work they're doing and also we tend to have really great ideation sessions straight after you know we've talked to a customer we've understood um, the problem we've identified some opportunities and it's just really great to then hear the team giving you back okay these are the ways these are all the ways that we could approach this so that's really good and then the last thing i just want to talk about is how do we um how do we make sure that all this feedback we're collecting this discovery we're doing doesn't go to waste how do we make sure it doesn't slip through the cracks um so this first one keeping on top of discovery is actually i, I like to look this to um to be a question for people on the call actually so how do you keep on top of doing discovery how do you get to a continuous model for discovery because ultimately what we want is that discovery isn't something that we do um you know kind of we do a little bit and then it's intermittent and we don't do it again but sometimes we do it or we treat it as this linear activity that only gets done at a certain point how do we actually build that pipeline how do you automate your customer recruitment so these are i'm asking these as questions because these are challenges that i think that i have um, and things that i want to uh, learn more about when it comes to discovery so some of the things and approaches that i've taken historically and, and currently is i've used things like customer panels so building a customer panel recruiting customers to that so you've always got this kind of pool this broad pool of a range of your types of customers that you can dip into people who have self-selected to kind of help you help give you feedback that's been successful in the past i think some of the challenges of that is how do you how do you make sure you're not just always hearing the same voices how do you keep that panel fresh how do you recruit people and just kind of start to um, make it automated um, one of the things that we're doing at the moment is we're getting we're trying to build a weekly cadence for those more generative um, conversations um, with customers so trying to uh, we're evaluating our customers we're segmenting them we're looking across them to see you know who who's not really spoken to us recently um who should we be speaking to and just trying to get going with kind of getting a weekly call in or a weekly a visit in with a customer so that we just get into the habit of doing that and then the other thing that i think really helps in helping build that discovery pipeline is um making sure that your customers have a way to give you feedback in an unprompted fashion so um so that and what i mean by that is you probably have a lot of conversations with customers but it's going to be driven by um some sort of engagement that they have with you so it's either you know a, a customer success call or a sales visit or you know a product uh discovery session that's about a specific thing um but i think it's really important that you enable customers to um you know to tell you what they want to tell you when they want to tell you without you having been involved and find a way to to enable them to do that um but i'm really interested to hear what um everyone else has to say about um how they keep on top of discovery and, and how do they how are they making sure that they're moving to a continuous uh this model for discovery okay so um you know how do you make sure it doesn't slip, slip through the cracks um i think you know feedback can actually be overwhelming um feedback collection and the output of a continuous discovery process can quickly become overwhelming particularly as you start to grow your customer base as you start to mature your pro product discovery um practices it can be a bit much and it can be overwhelming and you can think not know where to start with it so how how do we kind of get over this um feeling of being overwhelmed by feedback um 
and, and that challenge exists also because customer feedback lives everywhere right it's in all of the systems so it comes from many not only does it come from many sources via internal stakeholders and directly from customers it's also captured by many systems and mechanisms so it's going to be some notes in a crm somewhere there's going to be support or help desk tickets there'll be somebody's notepad it's just rolling around in someone's brain um, there'll be meeting notes documented somewhere uh, we used to have stuff in confluence probably stuff lives in jira there'll be the, that MPS survey or whatever surveys, that's all feedback, right? And how do we actually make sure that we are tapping into all of that? So discovery isn't just the things that we're, we're doing on our own, but all the things we're collecting from customers. How do we ensure that we're keeping track of, of all of this and we're not losing valuable customer feedback? So um, I think it's important to put good processes in place to ensure that the collection of the feedback and the transfer of this knowledge can happen. Um, so I think that we want to systemize and centralize the collection. Now that doesn't mean that, you know, we have one system that we do that in. All of those other systems can exist, but we have to have a way to bring that feedback into a single place that we can um, interrogate it and, and, and access that. So thank goodness for tools like PropAd. So um, I am a PropAd user and have been for quite some time. And yes, I absolutely do say thank goodness for tools like PropAd because what it allows you to do is to, is to do precisely that. Um, you can have feedback come in from different places, but because of the fantastic integrations, you can actually get them into where you need them to and use and then do um, what you need to there. Um, so I think it's important that you can, you should be able to ask questions of, of your feedback um, and your discovery. So it would be great to be able to ask questions like, what have customers told us about this problem? Or, you know, where can, you know where the problem can be um, an area of your product or you know whatever that problem might be or it could be something like i would really like to understand what this particular customer has told us um all the feedback we've ever had from them I'd, I'd like to be able to do that in order to be able to do that it does mean you have to systemize and centralize um and you want to be able to create really good artifacts um to be able um, to be able to answer the questions using your feedback so um I think that you've got to organize that feedback. So if you, once you've systemized it and centralized it, you want to be able to organize that feedback. So anyone who knows me well knows that I'm an excellent filer. If you look at my Google Drive, it's meticulously organized. I've got folders, subfolders, a lot of it. I'm not that organized about many other things in my life, but when it comes to that Google Drive, it's super organized. But you know, I, it's just because I need it to help my brain remember where to find things. Uh, drive search is infuriating at times. So I treat customer feedback essentially the same way. I think it's useful to classify your feedback with classifications that are relevant to you, of course. So, you know, which step of your user journey does this feedback relate to? Which part of your product does this feedback relate to? Things like that. Area of your solution, what problem type does this feedback relate to? And classify and be really, you know, be really good at how you do it. What that helps you do is it helps you to quantify your feedback and it helps you to prioritize the feedback um, you're getting about specific problems. Um, and then it also helps you to interrogate your feedback. So when you do want to ask those questions like, you know, what do we know about this? Or what have we learned about this? What's our discovery process told us about this particular problem? It's really easy to pull that all together. And this helps us access our learnings quickly. Um, so I'm asking what have you learned about this problem? And I can basically go and find that problem because I've classified the feed, uh, find all the feedback associated with that problem because I've classified it well. And again, before PropAd, that would have been really bloody hard and time consuming. Would have had to like go and find it in Confluence, go and find it in this other tool, go and find it in this other tool. But now we're able to kind of bring it all together. And the other benefit of that is it makes it transparent and accessible for your team, yourself, your team, but also the wider organization as well. So, the sort of discovery should be accessible to everyone. Um, you really want to build that empathy for the customers and get everyone on the same page about the problems we're solving and why. So, so it's really important that the output of your discovery is shared. So when it comes to customer feedback, I believe it's got to have that visibility for everyone on what we're learning and have good ways to communicate that back to your teams. Um, so share what you learn. Don't keep the discovery goodness for yourself. Um, part of the point is to get everyone on the same page about what we know about our customers what problems and opportunities are important to solve. Um, so some of the things that we, we do, um, we do discovery playback sessions with the team. So at Boxpot Me, we sometimes have a slot in our weekly meetings where we share what we've learned from customers that week with the wider team. 
for a video platform. Um, so oftentimes that will be, you know, recordings of, of um, conversations that we've had from people as well. Um, I think it's important to close the loop with your internal stakeholders. So, you know, if, if you think back to a few slides back, we were saying that feedback comes from a lot of sources internally. So it's really important if you're engaging your team in, in that kind of activity of collecting feedback and, and, and how we collect feedback and how we, we, um, we can share that. It's really important that you're closing the loop with them, you know, because they, they are stakeholders in the outcomes of, of some of those things as well and those conversations. So we do that through kind of the monthly meetings that we'll have with uh, our relevant stakeholders. Um, but I'd be interested to, to see um, and hear what other techniques people have for sharing what they've learned with their, with their teams and their wider organisations. And um, I think that brings me to the end. Thank you very much and happy to take any questions. Uh, coincidentally, the first question that came through is what tool do you use? <laughs> well, that was completely unplanned. <laughs> I, I just want you guys to know. Okay. I did not plan for that. Good. Well, as I mentioned, I do use PropPad, um, which I do highly recommend. Um, they've not paid me to say that. I just genuinely love the product so much. Recently introduced it to um, my colleague at Rockspot Me. And yeah, it, it's great when you have that moment when you've introduced something to someone and you know you want to step back and not be like, this is fantastic. You must use it. So I kind of step back and let her kind of give it a go and try other things as well. And it was really great to have her come back and go, oh my God, this is game changing. You know, being able to ask this question of our feedback and our discovery it would just be so hard, but now it's really easy. So, um, guys, we don't pay Kedri to say that, just so you know. They really don't. I'm, I'm just, I just want to make that clear. Uh, the follow up question to that was um, how do you collect and prioritize intelligence from the team? So, what does your process look like? Um, do you use any other tools? Uh, I, I, I guess in terms of collecting, but most importantly, I think, how do you actually get your team to adopt PropPad or whatever tool it might be? Yeah. To be um, part of the process, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it, it's about communicating um, the benefit of doing so. Um, and, you know, it's, it's in the interest of the team to um, collect and share what they're hearing, because oftentimes it's going to be beneficial to them if the product team reacts to it. So um, what we, we've done is just have, we've really engaged with all of the teams individually to communicate the benefit for them and why we're doing the process this way. So um, pre prop ad, so I mean, let's, let's be tool agnostic here. Um, there was a central way of, co of collecting feedback that we were hearing from customers. It just then ended up living in lots of places. And what we changed was that we wanted it all to live in one place. We didn't really want to change the collection mechanism. So the tools we use to get that intelligence is it's a multiple of things. It's kind of letting people submit what they've heard. Um, it's um, having regular um, conversations and catch ups with the, the internal teams um, that this is important to. So, you know, we, we speak with our sales team, um, our customer success team, our project we're actually an internal um they're one of our users they're an internal user so we speak to them a lot um obviously with the engineering teams as well um so it's making sure that you have a, a regular touch point with each of these teams where you are um essentially reviewing what's important the the actual collection we just want we want that to be so simple that it's just an ongoing activity an ongoing activity that the team knows that hey, I've got some feedback, this is where it goes. It's not a thing. As a product team, we're reviewing that periodically. And then when we then have those touch points with, with those teams, it's actually the conversation is a little bit elevated and it's less about capturing the feedback at that point. It's elevated to what are the important problems that we should, as a product team, we should be solving for you um, that's going to help you know, the sales team. What are the main problems of the sales team from all the feedback that we've had, you know, which are the things that are most important for us to move the needle on and doing that um, holistically so that we can then say, okay, as an organization, these are the problems that we're, we're thinking are important and connecting that to um, the top down uh, approach, which is where, you know, we're being driven by our objectives and the outcomes we want to achieve. So it's, it's marrying those two things together. But in terms of how we collect, the goal there really is to make that just a continuous, um, collection approach where our teams, our internal teams are just used to 
how they submit feedback to us and it's a process that we've bedded in um, and everyone's bought into why we're doing it and now everyone is bought into why we're centralizing where it all goes to um, so I don't know I don't think it took a lot to convince people about you know how we collect and also where you can automate automate you know don't make people do loads of work and double you know enter something here and enter something there if you can automate a process get them to put it in one place and you can automate it to get to where it needs to do that I would like to agree with that. Um, my, uh, my thoughts on collecting feedback is make it as easy as possible. The more you try to silo customers into one way of doing things, actually may cause them to not want to do it. So I think it's less about the tool or tools that you use, but rather once you get it, how do you actually track it? How do you put it into a single place where it's going to be helpful? not just to the product team, but you know, to everyone involved to be able to understand what your customers are struggling with. So in terms of tools, I say use as many as possible. <laughs> Don't <laughs> silo yourself, you know, have those conversations, open your social media, um, you know, have those tidbits on napkins and Zendesk and you know, whatever it is you use. Uh, like Kedji said, automate it. Um, and the wonderful thing is we do have an API um, or any tool that you use should have an API, should have Zapier um, to be able to bring those things in. Um, so a lot of the questions that just came in were about the tools, uh, which we've kind of tackled, but a really interesting one that just came through is how would you prioritize or channel internal feedback versus external feedback uh, within ProdPad or does it not matter whether it's external or internal? Okay, so the approach we've taken is um, we're talking about customer feedback um, internal feedback we just we, we label those as ideas and what we want to do is essentially be always we want to always be able to connect actual customer feedback to internal feedback because a lot of times you know we use our products we're going to have ideas we're going to get internal feedback um, but if it's just coming from us we want to validate that with customer feedback so we're going to want to associate any internal feedback to a customer feedback at some point. Um, so the distinction we make is when we when we use the terminology feedback, we actually mean what's coming from the customers and anything that comes from internal, we, we call ideas and we try and connect the two. And how do we prioritize those, I think was the other part of the question. Um, I think the prioritization absolutely is driven by, you know, is this a problem for the customer? Um, can we go and validate that it is and can we get customer feedback to, to, to bolster this idea that's come from an internal place? Cool, thank you for that. Um, guys, do we have any other questions? I'm gonna give you um, a few more seconds to drop those in. Uh, I feel like we should have some, some music in the background um, <laughs> while we wait. <laughs> um, but it doesn't seem like people have any other questions. Let me just check the chat. Um, in which case, I'm going to say thank you very much, Keji, uh, for uh, joining us. Uh, this was a fantastic talk. Um, and I completely agree. Uh, yeah, anytime. I completely agree that uh, you know, feedback should be something that we're always doing, always collecting, uh, instead of just doing it, you know, as you said, it's spur of the moment. That doesn't really help anyone. You have to continuously be gathering these uh, tidbits and information from customers. Um, so you guys, we will be sending out uh, the recording over the next few days, probably early next week. So if you want to share it, uh, please do so. Uh, Keji is on uh, Twitter. We'll be sending that as well if you want to follow her. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can always uh, tweet at uh, ProdPad or hello at ProdPad.com uh, and we'll be sure to uh, forward any additional questions over to Keji. Uh, so thanks again, uh, and see you guys next month. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one.